1981, HIV emerged in, in the United States. At first, it infected gay men, injection of drug users. And because we had judgments about those behaviors, we turned our backs on them. There was a huge space between those who had it and those that didn't. However, viruses are equal opportunity destroyers. So when women and children started to die from HIV, that space narrowed. Now you would think that we would have learned a great deal from those days. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. But we haven't. You would think that we would learn not to turn our backs on people, that we would be proactive, that we'd get involved really early and try to, to end a virus early in its stages. But we haven't. Right now, in the United States, there is a virus that is four times more common than HIV is. Hepatitis C, or HCV. Hepatitis C is infecting so many people that since 2007, the death rate from hepatitis C has exceeded that from HIV. Worldwide, 150 to 170 million people have hepatitis C. In some countries, the prevalence is 15% or more. And you would think, with a prevalence like that, it would wait, make way more headlines than Twinkies does. <laughs> However, we're not hearing about it. In the United States, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, they estimate that we have about three to four million people with hepatitis C. Now, by their own admission, they didn't include high-risk populations. So some experts believe that the number is closer to 5 million. But the highest prevalent is among baby boomers, people who were born in the years 1945 through 1965. Baby boomers represent 25% of the population, yet they're 75% of, of all hepatitis C cases and deaths. One in 30 baby boomers has hepatitis C. And I'm one of them. Hepatitis C replicates a trillion times a day in my body. It's destroying my liver, my health, messes with my thinking. And I just wish it could figure out how to destroy some skin tags and fat cells and it wouldn't be so bad. I guess the way to describe it is I feel like I'm running on three cylinders. Since 1997, I have been trying to raise awareness about hepatitis C. I'm an author, as was mentioned, educator, patient advocate, and I'm also a nurse. I can talk about hepatitis C a lot. My husband will testify to that. I think if I was going to write a memoir instead of it being eat, pray, love, it would be hepatitis C, hepatitis C, hepatitis C. So we don't have a lot of time here today, so I'm just going to cover on some basic facts. But for those of you who might have more questions that need answers, if you do an internet search of my name, my website will come up. And I'm not trying to promote my website as much as I want you to go to another link there, the HCV Advocate website. Great information. Now let's start with some basic facts. Hepatitis C, most common bloodborne virus in the United States. Bloodborne, that means that you have to have blood to blood contact in order for there to be transmission. So I can't just sneeze it across the space, so you in the front aisle, you're okay, don't worry about it, can't cough it up, and I'm really okay to share the same bottled water with or eat off the same plate with. Where is a problem is when there's true blood-to-blood -blood contact. Like injection drug users, they have a very high prevalence because they share 
all of the utensils that are related to injection drug use. We also see it in people who have received blood products or organ transplant prior to 1992. Anyone who works in the medical field or public safety where they can come in contact with blood has a risk factor. Veterans have a very much higher risk than the average population, particularly our Vietnam era veterans. And then children who are born from hepatitis C mothers, positive mothers, they have about one in 20 of them are born with hepatitis C. Where it gets sticky is when you have potential transmission routes that there's not clear blood, uh, blood to blood contact, such as inhaled, uh, like a straw for <coughs> cocaine use, or, oh, say, getting pierced or tattooed under less than perfect circumstances. Once it gets into the body, the site that it prefers is the liver. Now, what's interesting about the liver is that it doesn't have any nerve cells. So it doesn't have the ability to use pain to complain. The other thing about the liver is that it regenerates. It's constantly making new cells, so it just will stay a little bit ahead of hepatitis C. So it might take 10, 20, or more years before it shows up. But often when it shows up, it's too late. And by too late, what do I mean? Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a severe scarring of the liver. And at that point, because the liver has over 500 functions, the entire body is affected. The CDC estimates that there will be 1 million cases of cirrhosis just in the next decade, just from hepatitis C, not even including alcohol. That's not all bad news. The good news is there's treatment. The treatment works about 75 to 80 percent of the time. It's hard treatment. I call it uber chemo. It's got a lot of side effects. It takes a long time. I've been through it twice, one time for an entire year. I have a stubborn variety of the virus, so I still have it. But there's better treatments in development, and it's really, it's just a matter of time before I'm cured. Oh, did you hear me? I said cured. Because unlike HIV, there's actually a cure for hepatitis C. And when I talk about eliminate the virus, I mean eliminate permanently. That, of course, assuming that you don't have another infection, because you can get it twice. Now, in the meantime, I'm still not helpless. There's lots I can do. For instance, I need to abstain from alcohol. Alcohol is like fertilizer on, my, on the virus. I need to be careful about what I eat. But now I don't have to worry about Twinkies, so that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and I just try to lead, lead a clean lifestyle. You see, I'm one of the lucky ones. Because three out of four people who have hepatitis C they haven't been diagnosed yet. We know they're there, but they don't know they're there. And if you don't know that you have it, then you can't do anything about it. You can't go through treatment. You can't avoid alcohol. So the CDC said, OK, let's try to screen for these, for these people who don't know they have it. So this year, they instituted some recommendations. He said, let's test all baby boomers. One time blood test. Easy, insurance covers it. If you don't have insurance, it's still relatively affordable. You'd think that would fix the problem. Unfortunately, it's not. Because people are assuming their doctors have already tested them for it. Or worse, they say, oh, I've been vaccinated for that one. Well, there's no vaccine for hepatitis C. The other problem we're seeing is that physicians and patients are, they're still hung up on, ri on risk factors. They're thinking, why do I have to get tested? 
you know, some of them just don't really feel that they are at risk. Now, during the 60s and 70s, I was having a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And I realized that there are other people out there that might not have been having as much fun as I as I had. Now, they weren't, they might have been sharing the rock and roll part, but not the sex and drugs part of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But see, there was something that we were all sharing. We were all sharing in the community blood supply. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if Let's say someone had hepatitis C and they went to the doctor or the dentist. And then the next person was that person who didn't, wasn't having fun during the 60s and 70s. They could get hepatitis C because we weren't following the precautions that we are following now. So it is not about when you lived. It is about how, excuse me, let's try that again. It is not about how you lived, it is about when you lived. Now I'm looking around this room, and I see a lot of baby boomers here. Statistically, one in 30 of you has hepatitis C. And statistically, Three out of four of you do not know it. And if you don't know it, you can't do anything about it. And for those of you who are younger and you're wondering, so? Your mothers might have been baby boomers. Have they been tested? And if that test comes back positive, you need to be tested. And those of you who are relaxing because you were born before 1945, don't relax. You've got children, grandchildren, friends, relatives. But there's one thing that even though medicine can do something about hepatitis C, there's one thing it can't fix. And that's our attitude about it. There's a stigma with it. Yes, it is associated with injection drug use, but it's also potentially infectious. So people live isolated and in the shadows of it. But there's a subtler, a subtler attitude problem that needs addressing. When I told you tonight that I had hepatitis C, if you're like the average person, the next thought that popped into your mind was probably, hmm, I wonder how she got it. Now you knew I, I'm a nurse, so oh, that explains it. But then also I told you I had some fun during the 60s and 70s. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's it. But I don't think it's curiosity that makes us ask that question. I think we ask that question because we want reassurance. Tell me, tell me how you got it, so that I know that I can't get it. Let's maintain that space between us. I don't, I don't want this problem. Except there is no space between us. We, it's a problem for all of us. It's a problem because we share in Medicare costs, in healthcare dollars, and job loss. And we also share in our common humanity. Hepatitis C affects us all. And because we share this common bond, we share a common solution. See, hepatitis C doesn't care if there's a space between us. And it's time we start living that way, too. So here's what you can do. If you're a baby boomer, get tested. If you know a baby boomer, and I bet you know a lot of them, encourage them to get tested. And that's an idea worth spreading.